I know there's a lot of places you could be on a pretty Wednesday night in October, but you chose to come here. And uh, the Lord will bless you for putting him at the top of your list. He always does. So we'll pray and we'll get started. Father, thank you for this beautiful weather we've been having. We continue to pray for those who are suffering down in Puerto Rico and in Texas and in Florida from the recent hurricanes. We don't want to forget about them. We ask your favor and your comfort and your provision on them. And uh, Lord, we just pray for what's going to happen here tonight, not just in this room, but all across this campus from the little kids all the way up to us. We ask that you would uh, open our minds to understand the scriptures. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I begin tonight with a crazy but good question. Have you ever thought about the fact that our human body is actually dirt? Have you ever considered, cause, and I'm not being funny, that if you consider what it is that makes up human body, if you can break them, our content down, what it is made up of is dirt. It all is the same. In, if you study the, the ground, the earth, you will find the same components in the human body that are in the earth. If you don't believe me, go and buy. How many of y'all take a daily multivitamin? <laughs> y'all are unhealthy bunch. Okay. I don't either. I don't either, but I thought you all did. Okay. If you ever look at the back of a multivitamin, vitamin, you ever see what's it's it's dirt. It's the ingredients of the ground. Well, where else are you going to get it? From Pluto? I mean, anything we have here, you got to get here, right? Because we are here. So I want you to begin tonight, and, and I'm, I'm not just rambling, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, what we're talking about right now. It is the idea that everything that I am happens to match the ingredients of the ground that I walk on. The ingredients of the ground are actually what make up my body. So the question then remains is this, how did that happen? How did that happen? And there's one group of people that say that that's chance random processes and there was an explosion and there was the chemicals that mixed together randomly and they produced a slime, and the slime produced a, a, a amoeba, a tadpole, a molecule, a something, and eventually that little rascal slithered out on the ground and stood up. And that's why human bodies have the stuff of the earth, because we slid out of the earth and stood up. Now that's, that's a group over here, and there's another group over here that believes that, that God created the heavens and the earth. And he formed us in his likeness and in his image from the dust of the earth. And that's why that's on the ground is in us. Now, listen, one of us is wrong. We're not both right. Our bodies are the combination of the elements of the earth. And I believe, listen carefully, and the light and the breath of God. That our bodies, what's standing up here right now, is a combination of the elements of the earth. But inside the elements of the earth is the light and the breath of God. We are truly, here's, here's, here's chapter 4. We are truly fragile clay jars. We're not topsoil we're clay. And if you're from Anderson County, I hope you know what that means. Because topsoil, you know how you can tell what topsoil is? Topsoil, you can push it together in your hands and let go, and it just kind of falls apart down on the ground. We don't have a lot of that around here. Unless you go to the river bottoms. Out on my road, we've got about this much topsoil, and we've got a whole lot of clay. And when you've got clay, you put it together and you form it, guess what? You turn it loose and it'll bounce. I mean, it's, it sticks. It sticks together. You can make people out of this stuff. We are truly fragile clay jars that hold something. 
We're a jar. I want you to visualize tonight. We're jars. We're clay jars. We are, we are assembled by the ingredients of the earth. We are clay from the ground, formed by God, and inside of us is the light and the breath of the life-giving God. Now, that picture sets up chapter 4, verse 1. Here we go. Therefore, since God in his mercy has given us this new way, God in his mercy gave us a new way. Now, if you weren't here last week, you're, you're going to miss the connection. God in his mercy did something for us fragile clay jars. He gave us a new way. Well, what is it? Now, if you're here last week, it was clear that the new way is the new covenant. And the new covenant is the covenant of the Spirit. Well, where's the Spirit going to come to in the new covenant? In a temple in Jerusalem? Uh, 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 uh. He's going to move inside these fragile clay jars. This is the new covenant. So here we go. Therefore, since God in his mercy has given us this new way, we never give up. I want you to visualize right now, we're, we're formed by God from the earth, and he puts life inside of us, and he gave us a new covenant, a new testament, that, that his spirit is going to move inside here. So, based on that, guess what we don't do? We never give up. Now, I'm going to tell you, I've counseled a lot of people over the last 15 years. There's a constant in my counseling that I have used. Some of you probably have heard this come out of my mouth. You've been in my office. Here's what I say. You can't lose if you don't quit. So don't quit. I get couples come in and they're in marriage crisis. And one of them wants out. And they got 137 reasons why it's a good idea. And I just look across the desk and I say, you can't lose if you don't quit, so don't quit. But if you quit, you lose. So don't quit. Quit trying to make this complicated. It's not complicated. In Christ, listen, I'm going to put, a, I'm going to put a, 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 a restrictor on this statement. In Christ, in Christ, I cannot lose if I don't quit. So don't quit. I persevere. I stay in the game. If I get knocked down, what am I going to do? I'm going to get up. I cannot lose if I don't quit. Now, let me read that first verse again. Therefore, since God in his mercy has given us a new way, we never give up. We reject all shameful deeds and underhanded methods. We don't try to trick anyone or distort the word of God. We tell the truth before God, and all who are honest know this. You know what? The, we don't, I don't need to tell you a lie. I don't need to add to the scriptures. I can just tell you what the scriptures is. Are you ready for this? Everybody, everybody listen. Here it is. It is appointed unto man once to die. And after that, the judgment. There you go. You've all got an appointment. I got one. It is appointed on God's calendar. One day you will die. That's fragile clay jar. Unless Jesus comes first, it's going to die. It is an appointed time. You won't be early, you won't be late. And after that's the judgment. We don't need to trick anyone or distort the Word of God. You know why I don't have to trick anybody? Because if anybody, whether you believe in evolution or whether you believe in creation, whether you believe this fragile clay jar came from God or chance random processes and bullfrogs, it won't make any difference. You know, one day, you're going to die. What are you going to do about that? Ignore it? Pretend like it's going to happen to everybody else? You see, the new covenant is a new way, but to where? If you say way, a new covenant's a new way, then where are you going? This new covenant, this new testament is a new way. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all the way through Malachi is a, is a covenant of God. And here comes the new covenant, the new testament announcing a new way. Where we're we going? Here's the deal. Sin 
has cracked our fragile clay jars. Sin has cracked our fragile clay jars. And the light of life has, listen, has and is flowing out of God's created ones. Why? I know nobody wants to hear this, and I don't even like to say it. We in this room are all dying. We're all dying. Sin has cracked our fragile clay jars. We're all dying. Well, Terry, thanks for the encouragement tonight. I'll go home and watch John Wayne shoot somebody. Do you want the truth? We're all dying. Slowly. Some people are doing it fast. Some people are doing it slow, but we're all dying. God's new covenant, his new testament, has revealed a new way to where? Where are we going? A new covenant, new way. Where are we going? We're going to life. Somebody say amen. amen. We're going to life. That's where we're going. We're going to life. Anybody don't want to go to life? Everybody wants to go to life. The question is, which way is the way to life? If we refuse this new way, if we refuse this new covenant, if we refuse this new testament, or if we give up along the way, we're actually choosing death over life. We don't need to trick people. We don't need to deceive people. We simply use the truth of this new covenant, this New Testament. All you got to do is tell people the new way to life. The truth of God. That's what needs to be coming out of churches. That's what needs to be coming out of church people. The truth of God. The one that made these fragile clay jars can repair our brokenness and give us life. Do you believe that? The truth of God is that God can repair this broken, fragile clay jar. Right now, life is leaking out of this human flesh. One day, it will leak out to the point that it will not sustain itself. And there's a fix. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is a constant and absolute truth that no one can debate. Even if you believe in evolution, you can't debate death. That's why I don't need to trick you. That's why I don't try to trick you. I don't need to trick somebody because everybody's got the same condition. There's nobody in the room today that says, well, I don't have a fragile clay jar. Okay. Check back with me in 114 years. Yeah, you do. You see, there is a mystery that we struggle with today. Why do some people see this truth of the new covenant so clearly while other people hear the exact same message on exactly the same day and they got the exact same fragile clay jar body one person gets it and one person doesn't why it's a mystery this chapter deals with the mystery why do some people see this as good news what's the word gospel mean good news why do some people see this as good news? Why? There's a new way to life. They celebrate it, sing songs, go to a graveyard, and act like nothing ever happened. Why? Because they believe in the resurrection of the dead. And some people, they don't get it at all. In fact, in fact some people get mad because I believe in the resurrection of the dead, as if somehow or another I'm messing with their fragile clay jar. And they're mad at me. Like I'm giving people this false hope. Well, you want everybody to be miserable just like you? Hopeless just like you? Why do some people get it? Why do some people see the good news as bad news? And let me take it a step further, using previous chapters of 2 Corinthians. Why do some people smell this truth as a beautiful fragrance? This perfume. What? There's a new way to life. It's not by obeying laws and sacrificing animals in Jerusalem. Uh -uh. This is about the fragile clay jar 
opening up a place for the light of life to come in permanently and about. All you got to do is believe it and receive it. Why is it that one person sees that as a fragrance of beautiful aroma and another person sees it as the smell of death? I don't know. I don't know. So I'll ask you a question to answer the question. It's really the only logical answer to the question. Why do some people see it as truth and some people see it as a lie? Some people it is the fragrance of life, the other it is the fragrance of death. Why? There is another spirit. Is there another power at work among us? Okay, let's go to verse 3. I'm just going down through 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Is there another power, another spirit at work among us trying to confuse us, trying to deceive us? If the good news we preach is hidden behind the veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing. Satan, who is the God of this world. Now, I'm not going to read over that. Who is the God of this world? How many church people don't even know this? The Apostle Paul is announcing a spiritual truth that many in the church still don't get it. What? Satan is the God of this world. It's his for now. One day he's going to lose it. But for now, it's his. He has a power. He has a dominion. He has an authority. Where did he get it? He took it from Adam. It was given to Adam, and Adam gave it to him. He was deceived and gave it to Satan. And what does he do now that he has this power? What does he do now that he has this dominion? What does he do now that he is the God of this world that we happen to all live in, that we happen to come from? What's he do? He deceives you. Go back to the first verse 3. If the good news we preach is hidden behind the veil, well, who's doing that? Who's doing that? Who's, who's pulling a veil around you so you can't see? If the good news we preach is hidden behind the veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing. Now, what's the next sentence? Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. Who pulled the curtain over them? Satan. Can he do that? He is the God of this world. Is he real? You better believe he's real. They are unable to see. And you know what? If you can't see, you can't see. And going and fussing at somebody that can't see doesn't help them see. It just makes them mad when you tell them you can see. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message. What? I could hold up the Bible. They don't understand this message. They don't. Why? They can't see it. Why? Because there's a veil. Why? Because there's another spirit. Why? Because he's the God of this world. Why? Because Adam gave it to him. But there's a second Adam. They don't understand the message about the glory of Christ. Now, look, don't miss the last part. They don't understand the message, the good news, the new covenant about the glory of Christ, who is what? The exact likeness of God. The exact likeness of God. They don't see it. They don't see it. You can put it right in front of their face. They don't see it. I was reading from Jeremiah this morning in my quiet time. Jeremiah is in Jerusalem. And at this point where I was reading today, God has already told Jeremiah, stop praying for Jerusalem. Can, can you want to know what a dark hour looks like? A dark hour looks like? When God tells Jeremiah, don't pray for them anymore. And then there was a chapter that I got to just right after that. And it says that there are some that are devoted to destruction, and to destruction they will go. It's over. Why? Well, they can't see. What would praying do? There might still be time to remove the veil. But you're not going to pray anymore, Jeremiah, because I'm not going to remove the veil. And they will be devoted to destruction, and they will die. 
It's sobering stuff. The good news is the revealing of the new covenant. And yes, there is another spirit at work on this earth. Satan is blinding people to the good news, like he blinded Adam and Eve in the garden. Blinded by, how did he do it? How did he do it to Eve? How did he do it? He deceived her. You know what the deception is usually? It is a little bit of the truth wrapped in a fog. A little bit of the truth wrapped in a fog. There's a little bit of truth in there. Example, Eve, if you eat of this, you, you'll gain knowledge. Well, yeah. Yeah. But you might not want that. You'll be like God. Being able to choose good and evil. Yeah, but do you really know what that means? There's a little bit of truth, but it's wrapped in a fog. It's wrapped in a lie that doesn't look like a lie. Satan's blinding people. He has the ability to make our fragile clay jars unable to see. You hear me? Satan, the god of this world. Don't, don't, don't miss this. He is not some imaginary character. Satan, the god of this world, has the ability to make our fragile clay jars not see. Not see what? That Jesus is the exact likeness of God. If you thought Jesus was the exact likeness of God, you'd run to Jesus. Yeah, you would, every time, 100%. If you knew that Jesus was God come down to heaven in the flesh of a human, offering you eternal life, would you say, oh, I don't know, uh, I'm going to the ball game tonight? No, you run to Jesus. So, Pete, you can't see it. You, you don't see it. Satan has the ability to blind people so they can't see who Jesus really is. Next, uh, Romans 7, verse 11. I'm going to jump over to Romans. Sin did something. It not only cracked our fragile clay jar so that life starts seeping out, giving you an expiration date. Sin took advantage of the commands, and it deceived me. It used the commands of the law to kill me. Sin allows the light of light to depart from our flag, fragile clay jar, and when the light of life departs, guess what happens? I die. This deception started with Eve, but it continues even today among our fragile clay jars. So I want to fast forward to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 to illustrate that sentence. Go to verse 2. Paul says, I am jealous for you, church. He's referring to the church at Corinth. I am jealous for you with the jealousy of God himself. I promised you as a pure bride to one husband, Christ. But I fear that somehow your pure and undivided devotion to Christ will be corrupted. What's Paul afraid of after he leaves the church? I fear that somehow this pure devotion to Jesus will be corrupted. Well, who would do that? It'll be corrupted. Just as Eve was deceived by the cunning ways of, serp of the serpent. So, do you mean that what got Eve can get the church in the church age? Oh, yeah. Just as it got Eve? He's talking, this is New Testament. He's referring to the church in the church age. You can be deceived, just like the cunning ways of the serpent got Eve. Verse 4, you happily put up with what anyone tells you. Oh, here it comes. Church people, after Paul left, you happily put up with whatever everyone tells you, even if they preach a different Jesus. I'm going to make that number one. Even if they preach a different Jesus than the one I preached, and even if there's a different kind of a spirit than the one you received, or if there's a different kind of the gospel that you believe. So what would that look like today, right now? Is there a different Jesus? Is there a different spirit? And is there a different gospel? And if so, what would it look like if you were being deceived by the one who got Eve? Well, I thought about that. Not very long, but I did think about it for a while. Here's what I, you know what the different Jesus is? The Jesus that is taught by many today is this teddy bear Jesus. He's soft and he's cuddly. 
and you just hug on him all the time. This, this the new Jesus. Look at what Paul says. You happily put up with what anyone tells you, even if they preach a different Jesus than the one we preach. You know what? You know what this Jesus? He is no longer a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. He is no longer the suffering servant Jesus. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He has all power, all dominion, and all authority. And when he appears to the Apostle John in Revelation chapter 1, after John had spent three years night and day with him, what does John do? John falls down on his face as if he were dead when he comes into an encounter with Jesus. He's glorious. He is not teddy bear Jesus. You listen to all these. Let, let the world who doesn't believe in Jesus tell you what Jesus is. Look at the second one. He says, are you put up with a different kind of a spirit than the one you received? What would a different kind of spirit? Well, I can tell you what it looks like. Here's what it looks like. We're all following. We're all headed on the same road to the same God. We're just taking different paths to get there. Islam and Buddhism and Hinduism and humanism, it's just all the same path to the same God. It is the spirit of deception. It's not the Holy Spirit. There's one way, there's one truth, there's one life. And whoever calls upon his name and his name only, don't, don't, don't think that teddy bear Jesus is going to get there through Muhammad. It's not going to happen. What's the third one? He says there's a different kind of a gospel than the one you believe. Here's the modern American gospel. It's grace, 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 grace. And I'm going to tell you, grace is an amazing thing. But grace is not a license to rebel and sin against God. I don't know who told you that, but that's not the gospel that's in the Bible. I can tell you what the Bible says. Well, I can tell you what Paul said specifically. He says, should we continue to sin now that grace has been given? What's his answer? God forbid. How can we who are dead to sin, who died to sin when we died in Christ, how can we live any longer in that rebellion, in that sin? Oh, but you know what? The American gospel is grace, 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 grace. Nobody wants to talk about truth. John says God sent his son into the earth. He brought him here, and he is filled with grace and truth. Truth not just grace. Now listen, I'm all for grace. It's amazing. They ought to write a song about amazing grace. But it has to be attached to truth. Eve heard the word of God. Anybody here doubt that? In fact, when Satan asked her, what did she say? And God did say that we should not eat. Eve heard the word of God, didn't she? She didn't have to guess. She didn't have to live in a, an environment where, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, you do know. Eve heard the word of God. Eve heard the word of Satan. I want you to picture they stand side by side. Here's Eve in the middle. She heard the word of God. She heard the word of Satan. Eve listened to the wrong word. Eve died. Is that complicated? One is life, one is death. Is that complicated? Today, the Word of God reveals a new covenant, a new testament, that God has offered to save our fragile clay jars from death, and most will reject God's revelation of life. Eve didn't reject the Word of God for no reason, and neither do people today. Do you hear me? Eve did not reject the Word of God. She had it right there for no reason. There is a reason. 
Today, people are rejecting the Word of God. It's not for no reason. There's a reason. There's a power. It's real. There is another spirit and there is another word. But both of them, that spirit and that word, lead to death. It is a different gospel than the one preached by Jesus Christ. Go to John chapter 10. Here's what Jesus says. Jesus says, yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me, through me, will be saved. They will come and go freely and find good pastures. The thief, all right, there's another spirit. The thief, what's he doing? His purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. I'm going to tell you, there's a big difference between those two spirits, those two positions, those two ways, those two outcomes. And both of them have a word. All of us grew up watching cartoons, and what's the cartoon you see all the time? You see there's a devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other shoulder. What, it's kind of funny when you watch it in a cartoon it's not funny in real life but there is a truth to that cartoon there's two words there's two spirits there's two roads there's two directions there's two outcomes one leads to life one leads to death that's not funny it's the same as the garden of eden today one word gives life the other word gives death the real question is which spirit will you listen to? The Holy Spirit or the unholy spirit? Because there's only two choices. God loved the world so much that he gave his only son to stop these fragile clay jars from dying. That's what John 3.16 is. God loved the world so much that he gave his son to stop this fragile clay jar from leaking out all its life and turn into dust. Dead. God gave his only son to change mortality into immortality. You know what immortality means? You are not any longer subject to death. I'm going to ask you, does that change everything or what? If you knew that you were never going to die, wouldn't everything be different? Only if you believed it. God sent the Son with a new covenant. And listen, listen. I've read the book several times, and God sent preachers out as messengers of a new covenant. Now, I'm, I'm going to go to verse 5. We're in the same 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You see, we don't. Now, Paul was one of those preachers. He's running around with a bunch of preachers. Preachers of what? Of an of the gospel, of a new covenant, of the Spirit. You see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. <laughs> we preach that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. For God said, for God who said, let there be light in the darkness. Now, who said that? Satan or God? No, that wasn't Satan. God is the creator. He's the one that said, let there be light in the darkness he has made this light shine in where in our hearts so that we could know the glory of god that is seen in the face of jesus christ paul says what preachers don't preach about preachers if you got a preacher that preaches about himself you need another preacher preachers are fragile clay jars too You've heard me say on multiple occasions, uh, may I always preach as a dying man to dying men. Because I'm dying just like you are. And what in the world do I want to talk about me for? Why don't we talk about one that's not dying and that can fix fragile clay jars? He's the one we ought to be talking about. Preachers preach about the one who fixes us with the new covenant. Preachers proclaim that it was God, not Satan, that said, let there be light in the darkness. Now, Satan said, let there be darkness in the light. They're different messages. 
God has called preachers and put his glorious light inside of them so that they might proclaim the message of the new covenant of life. And guess what? If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, to some form you have become a preacher. Not just me. So here we are tonight in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky, and we all sit around in fragile clay jars that contain the life-giving breath of glass. That's who we are. No exceptions. We're all fragile clay jars. You come in here with a big giant stick and I stand here and you whack me enough times all that light will just come out of me and this fragile clay jar will hit the ground. That's how it works. You can't hit this thing but so many times in so many places and this fragile clay jar is going to go down. It's going to crack and that life's going to come out of it. That's who we are. Let's don't make ourselves out to be something we're not. We are fragile clay jars that contain life, but that life did not originate in us. It originated in a life giver. His name's not Satan. We know that fragile clay jars don't last forever. In fact, we've all noticed something. I think you've all noticed it. Nobody has gone over 120 since I've been looking around. Coincidence? In fact, some fragile clay jars don't last but a few years, and then the life leaves them. And I know at your age, my age, we've been around long enough that we've watched that happen on a few occasions. When you sit at somebody's bedside and you pray with them and you love them, you try to comfort them to some degree, and all of a sudden you, you watch them, they take a blast breath. And that fragile clay jar becomes a corpse. And it turns an ashen gray. The light has dissipated. There's no more breath. It's a corpse. You can shake it. You can do whatever you want to. It's gone. It's gone. I tell you what, you watch it a few times, it's humbling, isn't it? When you know that unless Jesus comes, that's me. And then there's this one who comes from heaven and says, I got this new covenant that I can fix fragile clay jars. I don't just fix them so that they run another 100,000 miles. I fix them so they never quit running. Now, I'm going to tell you what, that's good news. I don't even, I've never heard of good news better than that good news. But I've also concluded it's only good news to those people who believe it's good news. We know that when the life leaves these fragile clay jars, our clay jars do what? They turn back to dust from which they come. We know this is true. And you know what? We have this in common with unbelievers. Unbelievers also know that these bodies turn to dust. Wow, the evidence is clear. Unbelievers and believers both believe the same in this regard. These fragile clay jars, once the breath leaves, once the light of life leaves, they begin to decay and turn what? They turn to dust. God told Adam this was going to happen right after Satan's deception brought sin into the fragile clay jars. Coincidence on the timing? I don't think so. You see, originally, Adam's body was not fragile. Are you with me? Originally, their bodies were not fragile clay jars. They were enduring clay jars. Were they made from clay? Yeah. Did God bring his life and light and breath inside of him? Yeah. But were they fragile? Nope, 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 nope. Not fragile. They weren't breakable. Sin did that. In fact, God told Adam about the fragility of the clay jar after Satan brought sin. Let me read to you. Verse 17, Genesis 3. And to the man, Adam, he said, Since you listened to your wife, guys, there's sometimes to listen to your wife and there's sometimes not to. 
That goes both ways, by the way. Adam, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground, what, what's cursed? The ground is cursed because of you. All your life, you will struggle to scratch a living from it, the ground. It will grow thorns and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grains. And by the sweat of your brow, you will have, you, by the sweat of your brow, will you have food to eat until, until, this never happened before, this is new, until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from the dust, and to the dust you will return. So what is this new covenant that keeps our fragile clay jars from turning to dust? What is this new covenant that keeps our fragile clay jars from becoming fragile? We all came from Adam, and Adam came from dust. So how can we fix these fragile clay jars? 1 Corinthians, not 2, we're going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Adam, the first man, was made from the dust of the earth. While Christ, the second man, came from where? Was he made from dust? Nope. He came from heaven. Earthly people, and I'm looking around. Yep, that's us. I'm expecting one little alien to raise his hand back there somewhere. A Martian. Earthly people, what? Earthly people are like the earthly man. Guess who that is? Adam. And heavenly people are like the heavenly man. Well, who are they? Just as we are now like the earthly man, we're all a bunch of Adams, right? Adam's family. <laughs> yeah, crazy. Crazy Adam's family. What's fragile clay jars that are leaking out life. Sorry about that, Adams family down in Michelle Adams has taken offense to that already. Just as we are now like the earthly man, we will someday be like the heavenly man. Do you get that? Do you, do you understand what that just said? I'm right now, and you are too, whether you want to acknowledge it or not, we are like Adam. We're fragile clay jars. Because that's our origin. I'm not from heaven. You're not from heaven. And just as we're now like the earthly man, we will someday be like the heavenly man. There it is. I will tell you, that sentence, there it is. There's the new covenant. The life-giving spirit of Jesus Christ enters these fragile clay jars and the light of life pierces our darkness of dust. There it is. Here's what it means to be a believer. Right now, I am in a fragile clay jar that Adam gave me. But the man from heaven has made me an offer. This is what it means to be a believer. Now, go back to 2 Corinthians 4. We're in 4. Wow, we're in 7. We're in 7 verses, okay? Look at the time. 45 minutes, and we're in verse 7. Now... We now have this light shining in our hearts. But we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. What is this great treasure inside this fragile clay jar? This makes it clear that our great power is from God. It's not from ourselves. Yes, the light of Jesus now abides in the hearts in our hearts, inside these fragile clay jars. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? That this temple, this body, this fragile clay jar is the temple of the Holy Spirit. He moved in. There's the gospel. It's treasure. What's treasure? My fragile clay jar? Uh, my fragile clay jar is just dirt. What's the treasure? The one that moved inside of me is the treasure. But we still, even, okay, okay, Terry, the fragile clay jar has now been inhabited by the Holy Spirit. But we still have fragile clay jars. 
huh? You still hit me with a stick long enough, I'm going to the ground. Even if the Holy Spirit is inside of me, you hit me with a stick enough times, I'm going to go down. I'll stop breathing. The light of life will seep out of me. So how does that make you rejoice? How? Think, I want you to think. There's a resurrection. It's a treasure. It's inside of you. But right now, at least for today, we have a fragile clay jar that this light of treasure resides in. But one day a resurrection will occur. We will not be resurrected into fragile clay jars. Somebody say amen. We will not be resurrected into fragile clay jars. We will not be resurrected into human flesh after the fall of man, human flesh. We will be resurrected. Are you with me? Here we go. We will be resurrected into glorious flesh like Jesus' flesh, like the heavenly man flesh. Not like the first man from earth flesh, the heavenly man flesh. That's the resurrection. Let me prove it to you. 1 John chapter 3. See how very much our Father loves us? For He has called us His children, and that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we're God's children because they don't know Him. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but He has not yet shown us what we will be like. You hear me? He's not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. Right now, we still have to guess in some regard. But I can tell you what we do know, what we do know, what we do know. But we do know we will be like Him. That's enough. I'll wait on the rest. That's enough. We will be like him, the man from heaven. For we will see him as he really is. And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure just as he is pure. Can I ask you all a question? I do have this eager expectation that you can't wait to see him. That you can't wait to see him. That you can't wait to see him. Because I'm going to tell you, if that's not in your heart, you've got a problem tonight already. There is a problem, problem problem in your life right now if you can't say honestly that you can't wait to see him then there's something you got you got you're gonna have to deal with this i want to read verse 49 one more time just as we are now like the earthly man we will someday be like the heavenly man i'm gonna tell you what if this was a card game i took all the chips i had and i put them on that sentence I bet the farm. What? That I, uh, listen, I bet, I bet everything I got. And, and I'm being serious. I have made a decision to take everything that I have, all that I have or ever will have, and place a bet that this is true, that I am right now like the earthly man and I live in a fragile clay jar. But someday I will be with and like the heavenly man. So what about the other spirit? Is he gone? Where is he at? Will the other spirit stop opposing us after we've received the light of glory inside our fragile clay jars? You think? You think once Jesus moves inside my temple, Satan's out of here. Right? Do you remember he is the God of this world? So let's go to verse 8. All right, we're in verse 8. We're moving real fast now, okay? We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. So we live in the face of death, but this has result, resulted in eternal life for you. 
Satan is still working, opposing the work of God. What's he doing? Jesus gave us his resume. You know what his resume had on it? Kills, steals, destroys. He hasn't needed to update his resume. Kills, steals, destroys. Same thing. Is he still doing it? Still doing it. How does he do it? It's important that you not just look at kill, steal, and destroy. How does he do it? He deceives you. He pulls the veil over your face. Satan can't remove the light of life from our fragile clay jars. Do you know that? Some of y'all need to live in some freedom on this sentence. Satan, as powerful as he is, he is the God of this world. He does kill, steal, and destroy. He does deceive. But he cannot come inside of me and take away the light of Christ from my temple. He cannot do it. If he could, he would. He can't do it. I don't know about you, but I get a great deal of comfort from that. His only hope is to get... So if he can't take it away, if he can't reach inside of Terry Cooper, grab the light of God, and drag it out of Terry Cooper, what's his plan? His only hope is to get us is to convince us that the new covenant is not true. His only hope, his only way to snatch out of you the light of life, the only hope is to convince you, to deceive you, so that, listen, 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 you quit. You quit. You just turn around and walk away. Satan's hope is to convince us to listen to his word instead of God's word. And can I say something? If I look at the American church, he is effective. You know what the one thing the American church is laying down is the one thing that the American church can't survive without, the word of God. He's good at it. He is the deceiver. What was it in the beginning? God's word? Satan's word. Here's Eve. God's word. Satan's word. God said no. Satan said yes. God's word. Satan's word. So, what should we do? What should preachers do when we face such opposition from Satan? Okay, I'm glad you asked. Verse 13. We continue to preach. Because we have the same kind of faith that the psalmist had. You know what that was? When he said, I believed in God, so I spoke. <laughs> you know what that's called? It's called a testimony. I believed in God, so I testified. I encountered God, so I testified. I believed in the Word when I encountered the Word, so I testified. We know that God who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself together with you. All of this is for your benefit. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be a great thanksgiving and God will receive more and more glory. We preach what? We preach the resurrection of the dead. You know what that is? It's the cure of death. If you believe in the resurrection of the dead, you believe that death has been cured, it's conquered. We preach the truth that these fragile clay jars are going to get new heavenly jars that aren't fragile, they're eternal. Some are going to believe our message and some won't. So what are we going to do? Quit? Did you hear me? Some, I get it. You know what? It took me years to get it, but I get it. I'm afraid if I didn't get it, I would have lost my mind. We're going to preach the word, and some are going to sit in this room, and they're going to get it. Some are going to hear it, and some are not going to get it. I don't know which is which, but I know this. I'm going to keep preaching it. And you might preach it to a 1,000, and only 20 might get it. So what am I going to do? Because the others didn't, I'm going to quit. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm going to preach it for the 20 that will. And you know what? You're supposed to too. And there's this idea in the modern American church is because the entire culture hasn't gotten it, we ought to lay down somewhere. That's not it. 
If you quit, Satan wins. You can't lose if you don't quit. So don't quit in Christ. Satan's going to oppose us, and he's going to fight us on every side. Guess what? We're in his territory, right? We are behind enemy lines. It's, he is the God of this world. We're in his territory. One day Jesus is going to come back and stand on the Mount of Olives, and he's going to say, it's mine! And Satan's going to be bound and thrown away. But until that day, this is his territory. We're behind enemy lines. Are you surprised that he opposes us? Of course he opposes us. We're in his territory. There's one thing believers can do. Stop believing. I, I, I counsel you tonight. There's one thing that's a fatal flaw. If you stop believing. Well, listen, I want to clarify something and I'm going to close. Are there moments of doubt for everybody in this room, including myself? Yes. Are there moments of weakness in my life? Yes. Do those moments of weakness create in my mind moments of moments, moments, moments of doubt? Yes, 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 yes. As long as you're breathing air, you will experience moments of doubt. What I do when I have moments of doubt is I put my doubt under the authority of the Word of God. And my doubts dissipate into faith. But now here's the warning, here's the warning, here's the warning. Prolonged, untreated doubt produces unbelief. And do not let anyone tell you that's not true. Prolonged, untreated, unrepentant doubt produces unbelief. So, so what's the cure to doubt? Truth. When I have moments of doubt, when I feel weak and drained, I bring the Word of God and I put it against my life. And somehow or another, I, don't even tell, I can't tell you how it works, that Word takes my doubt and pushes it out. And I have this confidence. I have this confidence. I have this strength. That comes not from the doubt. No, the doubt drains me of that strength. The Word fills me with that strength. It is the bread of life. It makes me strong when I eat it, when I put it inside of me. The Word is not just letters on a page. The Word is a person. His name is Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He's on. He is, this, he is this message. He's not just reading the message. He is the message. Who do you think's moving inside of you and fixing your fragile clay jar? He is. We never give up believing. Verse 16. That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. Satan wants us to give up to doubt and eventually stop believing and what's at stake what if you do huh what if life just gets so heavy and the opposition gets so harsh and finally you just say heck with it i'm out of here what's at stake you're gonna die let's read those last two verses for our present troubles are small and won't last very long Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles. We don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone. But the things we cannot see, how long are they going to last? Forever. Father, thank you for your word. Now fill us with your abiding presence. May it come, may you come in power and authority and may you reign in us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all.